We're back at it again with the technician license question pool. The goal here is to give you quick information in sub elements. There are multiple sub elements that make up the technician license exam. And so my goal is to go from the hardest sub element to the easiest sub element. Because generally, if you increase your chances of answering the hard questions, the easier questions you probably already know or they're gonna be real easy for you to remember. So we're going hard to easy and we're continuing this with sub element T3. I am using hamstudy.org for these videos. Hamstudy.org is gracious enough to lend me information like the testing of multiple people, over a thousand at this point, so I'm able to tell you exactly the questions and sub-elements that people miss the most, and so that's why we're doing it in this order. Hamstudy.org is a free service. You can, down, you can go online, you can make an account, and it will track your progress as you take practice exams. I argue that once you hit that 75% on multiple practice tests, you're ready. Go take the test. So I hope this helps. Let's get started. Subelement T3A specifically talks about radio wave characteristics, how they propagate, how radio waves move around our atmosphere. This is also one of my favorite subelements. So let's get things started with T3A01. What should you do if another operator reports that your station's two meter signal were strong just a moment ago, but now they are weak and distorted? I'm assuming many of you have heard this possibly on a repeater or simplex in your local home or you're in your mobile running around town. D, try moving a few feet or changing the direction of your antenna if possible as reflections may be causing multi-path distortion. If you're walking around with an HT, you know, walking around town, you know, you're walking through the downtown area, grabbing a bite to eat, you have an ice cream cone in one hand and you're talking and you're moving around and you, you started transmitting over here, but then you kind of started turning over here or maybe you're you know, talking to somebody and you kind of just didn't pay attention. You kind of maybe had this at an angle. That's all gonna affect the, the, the way this antenna propagates RF. The best situation you can have is just hold it you know, close to your face for the appropriate you know, distance from the mic and keep it vertical, right? And if you start to you know, get complaints that your signal's bad, step away from buildings, step away from things that may cause this reflection distortion, get away from something that's metal or metallic, and then try again and see how you do. The good news here in this case is they heard you strong enough at one point, so you just need to walk back, uh, find where you were good again, and, and try it out and see if that fixes it. T3A02 is a fun one. Why might the range of VHF and UHF signals be greater in the winter? VHF, UHF, line of sight radio, right? Repeaters, handhelds, two-way communication. The answer is B, less absorption by vegetation, specifically leaves. They're talking about leaves and trees when you're in springtime and there's lush foliage everywhere and you're talking. Those you know, organic materials actually will absorb RF. So if you get better out in the winter versus the summer, it could be due to vegetation. T3A03, what antenna polarization is normally used for long distance weak signal CW, which is continuous wave Morse code, and SSB, which is single sideband, that's a voice way of communicating, contacts using VHF or UHF bands. And in case I haven't said this, VHF, very high frequency, UHF, ultra high frequency. It's just a different space of, of the frequency that you're operating on, have a different nomenclature, different name. The answer is C, horizontal. When you're working long distance, weak signal voice contacts, let's just use that for, for instance, you're generally gonna be using modes like single sideband. That's not what this uses. This uses FM. Single sideband is more efficient than, M, uh, than FM for putting your RF out of your antenna. For those of you that understand what I'm saying, it's just a different mode of operation. Like AM radio, that's a way of transmitting RF. FM, that's another mode that we transmit data or information like voice information over RF. Single sideband is just a little bit more efficient than both AM and FM. Actually considerably in the case of F or AM. Okay, so. Why do we use a horizontal antenna to go back to our dipole example if I'm holding horizontal, meaning parallel to the earth antennas versus vertical antenna? Well, the answer historically is believed because of the television industry. 
most of the antennas that you see on houses that are specifically for analog televisions are horizontally polarized. The belief is that the television community, when they were still doing analog television, believed that tropics, tropospheric conditions favored uh, horizontal antennas versus vertical antennas. The reality is you can do single sideband and Morse code with a vertical antenna. Nothing is stopping you. But if the station that you're trying to transmit to is horizontal versus your pro uh, vertical, they will see a dB loss in the power that's received by them. Now, I, I do want to add a bit of practicality to this one. Horizontal antennas generally for two meters are, are pretty, and, and also 70 centimeters UHF, are, are good uh, horizontal because you can just build a Yagi out of them really effectively. Uh, you can do a vertical Yagi, but they're, they're kind of more effective depending on how you're using them if they're horizontally based. And building a Yagi is really inexpensive. You can get parts at your Lowe's or Home Depot. You can use a tape measure to build a Yagi if you're so inclined. So that's why I, I don't care either way. And I think reality is just a historic answer why we use horizontal for weak signal. But uh, there is a practical reason and that's building a Yagi is very easy, particularly horizontal. T3A04, bit of a continuation. Hopefully we're laying out a story here. What can happen if the antenna at the opposite side of the VHF UHF line of sight radio link are not using the same polarization? Well, if you remember to 10 seconds ago, B, signals could be significantly weaker. B is the answer here. Because again, and I, I'm not sure of this number, but uh, if you're transmitting it vertical and they're listening at horizontal, I believe there's a 3 dB loss in that uh, translation that, that goes in there. So keep that in mind. Uh, make sure you're matching the polarization of whomever you're trying to talk to. And I'll give you the flip side. Uh, it's coming up later. We'll just wait for that. TA305, using a directional antenna, so a beam, as we said in the last video, how might your station be able to access a distant repeater if buildings or obstructions are blocking the direct line of sight path. This is a fun one. B, try to find a path that reflects signals to the repeater. So if your straight shot is blocked by a bunch of buildings and you got kind of like a, maybe a, a mountain face on the side, well maybe try pointing at the mountain and get a little uh, twisting, uh, turning action or reflection uh, off the mountain to hit the repeater. That's totally viable to do and, and a lot of people have to do that to make it work. T3A06, what term is commonly used to describe the rapid fluttering sound sometimes heard from mobile stations that are moving while transmitting? And it's called B picket fencing. And it's, it's literally a, a fluttering up and down um, of intensity. The volume that they're normally at kind of goes up and down in, a, in, you know, it's literally a wave. It looks like a picket fence or more like a sawtooth, I guess, or something along those lines. T3A07, what type of wave carries radio signals between transmitting and receiving stations? Electromagnetic. And they're actually opposed. So while you have the electric wave going vertically and the magnetic wave is going horizontally and they're kind of doing this number. Ooh, that's a, look at that. Hey, can you do that? Uh, there, there's plenty of videos online or, or animated GIFs that show you how while one is up here vertical, the other is out over here to the side, and they're constantly opposed to each other is, is generally the way I think about it. TA308, which of the following is likely is a likely cause of irregular fading of signals received by ionospheric reflection? Now we're talking about our RF hitting the ionosphere, and unlike our, our VHF UHF pals um, in punching right through it, it's actually reflecting back down towards Earth via the ionosphere, different layers of the ionosphere, and depending on what frequency you're using. The answer to this is C, random combining of signals arriving via different paths. So what that's saying is you have all kinds of different people transmitting at any one time, possibly on the same frequency that you're transmitting on, but you may not be hearing them coming in from wherever the station is that you're talking to on their path, their bouncing propagation path. It's coming in from another path and combining, and then that's what you're hearing. So you're getting distortion, you're getting kind of jarbled, um, jarbled language, jarbled signal, whatever. And, and that's a, a byproduct of that happening when there's a combining of the effects of this ionospheric reflection. T3A09, this is a, another favorite question of mine. Which of the following results from the fact that signals refracted from the ionosphere are elliptically polarized? What is that question saying? It's saying 
I've got a horizontal antenna at home. I blast out my RF, it hits the ionosphere and it bounces and it comes back down. Well, once it hits that bounce, all bets are off. It's no longer horizontally polarized. It's all kinds of polar polarized at that point, specifically elliptically polarized. The answer to this is important. It's why HF uh, radio stations, we don't depend on that whole game of the weak signal VHF of vertical versus horizontal and vice versa. It's because it doesn't matter. Once we get that uh, elliptically polarized by bouncing off the ionosphere, the answer here is B, it doesn't matter. Either vertically or horizontally polarized antennas may be used for transmission or reception. That's why we can use a DX commander in the backyard and a dipole on the roof or wherever. Now, while that is true, there are reasons why you might want to use a vertical or a horizontal and vice versa, depending on where you're at and your situation. They hear and transmit equally well in some situations, but that's just something to keep in mind that you won't see those dB losses like you do with VHF, UHF, um, when you're talking about HF and anything that can bounce off the ionosphere. Another fun question, T3A10, also one of my favorite planes, the A10. What may occur if data signals arrive via multiple paths? Again, harken back to what we just said about um, other paths combining in the ionosphere and coming back down. What happens if you had multiple data signals, right? Like you're using keyboard to keyboard data communication, that kind of thing. Well, if that happens, D, error rates are likely to increase. If you had a coax line, pretend this is coax for your network home computer, and you had one coax line and you had three or four computers all spliced into it and you were trying to transmit data, that would be horrible. You'd have all kinds of packet collisions and all kinds of nightmare of, of that kind of thing. Well, the same thing applies. We're on one frequency, one very specific frequency, and we have three different radios transmitting at us at that frequency. Oh, that could be problematic and cause error rates to incur. And that's why. T3A11, sometimes the order of these is curious to me. What part of the atmosphere enables the propagation of radio signals around the world? The answer is C, the ionosphere. We've already been talking about it, so hopefully you're not surprised by that answer. T3A12, how might fog and light rain affect radio range on 10 meters and 6 meter bands? The answer here is B, fog and light rain, light being bolded, will have little effect on these bands because those, these bands, 10 meters and six meters, behave a lot like VHF, UHF. And we kind of already talked about that has a tendency to punch through the atmosphere and other atmospheric conditions like fog and light rain. T3A16, what weather condition would decrease range at microwave frequencies? And the answer is C, precipitation. precipitation. What's that? You mean I, I was editing the video and I forgot a clip and then I would just decided I'd run back in here and, and do it and, and hope to pass it off? No, I didn't do that. Maybe you forgot. Maybe you forgot the next scene. Maybe that's what happened. All right, we've hit sub-element three, section B. Let's continue right along with question one. What is the name for the distance a radio wave travels during one complete cycle? That's its wavelength. From valley to peak or peak to valley, that is one wavelength. That's its cycle. T3B02, what property of a radio wave is used to describe its polarization? And that would be the orientation of the electric field. Remember, it's an electromagnetic wave, so there is going to be a position for the electrical and a position for the magnetic wave within that electromagnetic wave. <laughs> so it's the electrical we use for determining the polarization of said wave. And just following right along with that, T3B03, what are the two components of a radio wave? An electric and magnetic field. So if you've ever watched my videos on a magnetic loop, a big metal loop, that antenna is uh, more effectively radiating magnetic waves than its electric counterparts. There's more into the weeds on that one, but that's the end of this question. T3B04, how fast does a radio wave travel through free space? And the answer is, at the speed of light, generally. You don't need to go any deeper than that for this question, but you know you could deep dive this whole thing if you wanted to. Fun fact, uh, if you are transmitting at the right time uh, with the right sun cycle, which may come up in the future, I'm assuming, in this, uh, in this question sub, uh, subcategory, and you're transmitting voice and you've got a beam antenna pointing that way, um, you may actually get a completely around the earth and pick your own self up and hear it in your ears uh, from your radio. That is a trippy thing that happens.
T3B05, how does the wavelength of a radio wave relate to its frequency? The, the wavelength gets shorter as the frequency increases, and that's answer B. A really easy way to look at this is the physical wavelength of a two meter, right, wave uh, signal, wave coming out of this uh, radio is from peak to valley, two meters, roughly. 40 meters, peak to valley, one wavelength, 40 meters. So that is a big, wide wavelength, 40 meters, versus a little tiny wavelength of two meters. And that goes all the way up to the gigahertz space. And boy, those are really, really tiny. Centimeter wave, millimeter wave, that type of stuff. T3B06 is a continuation of something we said in the last video. And, and I'm going to be able to describe this in a little bit better now. What is the formula for converting frequency to approximate wavelength in meters? Approximate being the key word because uh, I gave you a different answer in the last video. But the answer in the question book and the one you got to remember is... D, wavelength in meters equals 300 divided by frequency in megahertz. Okay, so keep that in mind. These are differences in numbers. I said 234, that was to get out inches. This is saying wavelength in meters, 300, 300 divided by the frequency in megahertz. That's gonna spit out that uh, distance in meters. So keep that in mind. T3B07 asks, what property of radio waves is often used to identify the different frequency bands? And it's A, the approximate wavelength, the approximate wavelength. T3B08, what are the frequency limits of the VHF, which stands for very high frequency spectrum? And the answer is B, 30 to 300 megahertz, which encompasses broadcast FM, um, air band for planes and VHF amateur radio bands, okay? Now, th these uh, spectrum allocations, these slices that have their own names like VHF, you can look these up on Wikipedia. There's multiple band charts you can buy that will display this. A lot of this was just something like we had to slice this up and give it a name, and so that's kind of why we did it. T3B09, carrying along with that same concept, what are the frequency limits of the UHF spectrum? And the answer is D, 300 to 3000 megahertz. So your 70 centimeter radio transmits at, you know, around 400, 440 megahertz and up from there. That's going to be part of the UHF, ultra high frequency spectrum. T3B10, what frequency range is referred to as HF, high frequency, my favorite spectrum. That is 3 to 30 megahertz. And that comprises 80 meters at the low end up to 10 meters on the high end. What's emitted from that? Six meters is emitted from that, not a part of the HF space. And on the low side, you don't have the 160 meter band, which is considered uh, low frequency radio. T3B11 asks, what is the approximate velocity of a radio wave as it travels through three free space? And it is 300 million meters per second. So yeah, pretty fast. We have completed sub-element three, section B. We're rolling right into sub-element three, section C, which has to do with Line of sight, sporadic E, meteor and aurora scatter reflections, tropospheric ducting, F layer skip, and radio horizon. That's a lot of stuff. This is the quirkier side of some of the magic you can do with VHF, UHF. A lot of stuff in here. So let's dive right in with T3C01. Why are direct, not via a repeater, UHF signals rarely heard from stations outside your local coverage area? And the answer is C, UHF signals are not reflected by the ionosphere. That is a very specific roundabout way of saying that UHF signals are line of sight. Meaning, this if you had enough power, right, and, and you had no obstructions, and you were just kind of standing in this magical free space, that UHF signal is going to fire out, at least you know some portion of it, it's going to fire out and go straight off of your radio. Eventually... If it was an HF radio, that signal would hit an ionos hit the ionosphere at some point, and hopefully some of them would, would bounce back towards, towards Earth, giving you a much broader sphere of coverage with your radio signals than this radio does. Why? Well, because when it hits the atmosphere at UHF, it punches right through and keeps going. 
That's the reason why we as amateur radio operators use VHF and UHF to talk to amateur radio satellites because it punches right through, which in that case is a very good thing. T3C02, which of the following is an advantage of HF versus VHF and other higher frequencies like UHF? C, long distance ionospheric propagation is far more common in HF. We can consistently do very far distance communications on HF every day, depending on the day-night cycle where the sun is and which band we use um, at any given moment. So it's much more effective to be able to communicate long distances with HF radio. T3C03, what is a characteristic of VHF signals received via auroral reflection? So like aurora borealis, that kind of thing, auroral reflection. B, the signals exhibit rapid fluctuations of strength and often sound distorted. Uh, if you've watched Ham Nation after I've taken it over, Gordon West did a little presentation and he talked about aurora um, reflection and the signals, he actually had a recording of some of them, very distorted, very difficult to hear, but also really cool that we can use, uh, we can use the aurora to reflect our RF off of, which is super cool and does make for a longer distance contact in some cases. T3C04, which of the following propagation types is most commonly associated with occasional strong over the horizon signals on 10, 6, and 2 meter bands? And that's sporadic E. Sporadic E is a really interesting uh, form of propagation. Basically, it is the E layer of the ionosphere in certain situations can have this highly ionized pocket that will refract, reflect uh, VHF signals back to Earth. And that will cover 10 meters, 6 meters, and 2 meters. And what's cool about that is you may pick it up on 10 meters and be able to make these cool long shot conversations. But as it fades in 10 meters, it may pick up on six. And as it fades on six, it may pick up on two. So you could have like a multi, you know, hour event that occurs, although that's kind of rare uh, with sporadic E and, and those different radios, if you have those at, their, at your disposal. The advantage of that is that you can get a pretty decent range. You can get um, over a thousand kilometers in some cases with, with sporadic E with, you know, your VHF radio. Would it be this radio with this little antenna? Maybe not, but you get the idea. T3Z05, which of the following might cause radio signals to be heard despite obstructions between the transmitting and receiving stations? So like a mountain or something like that. A, knife edge diffraction. Now, I don't think this is the right way of, of thinking about it scientifically, but how I always view it is um, the Dark Side of the Moon album cover, the light going into the prism and then the refraction of the colors coming out of it, or the diffraction or diffusion, and probably the wrong word. Uh, I, I feel like it hits you know, the, the peak of a summit and then kind of bends down, bends back. Uh, I think that's the right way of looking at it. It may not be scientifically accurate, but it's a good way to remember how it functions. T3C06, what mode is responsible for allowing over the horizon, which means beyond line of sight, further than line of sight communication, for VHF and UHF communications to ranges of approximately 300 miles on a regular basis? The answer is tropospheric ducting. This is also a lower um, ionos atmospheric condition, not in the ionosphere, in the atmosphere, where you have a pocket of ionized gases, atmosphere, something along those lines, and it actually will refract your VHF signals. Also done on Ham Nation, Gordon West did a fantastic little talk on tropoducting or tropospheric ducting, which I will link in the description so you can go listen to that. Again, no expert in this space, but I know the answer is tropospheric ducting, and it's largely due to the range, which is about 300 miles at max. T3C07, what band is best suited for communicating via meteor scatter? And that's B, the six meter band. And literally that is, you know, meteorites coming into Earth. You can bounce your, uh, your signals off of that. Uh, largely you need to have like a meteor shower situation when that's the most effective. But you're also generally going to require a pretty decent antenna setup and uh, also an appreciable amount of power to make that effective. T3C08, throwing it back to tropoducting again. What causes tropospheric ducting? And the answer for this is D, temperature inversions in the atmosphere. Cold fronts hitting 
warm fronts and whatnot creates this disturbance, this pocket, if you will, where VHF signals can refract. T3C09, what is generally the best time for long distance 10 meter band propagation via the F layer? A, from dawn to shortly after sunset during periods of high sunspot activity. We are approaching a solar maximum. Uh, up until 2025, we are going to be experiencing ever greater sunspot activity, which means our signals, particularly on the higher bands of HF, are going to propagate much better. 10 meters in this case, maximizing the time when the F layer is visible with less E layer activity, that's going to get you much further contacts, and that's going to be towards dawn and towards or just after sunset. T3C10. Which of the following bands may provide long distance communication during the peak of the sunspot cycle? Again, sunspot cycle, we're talking about the solar maximum, which is an 11 year cycle that the sun goes through. Minimums and maximums at the round five year range, flipping back and forth. A, six or 10 meter bands. Again, high side of the HF bands and six meters is actually part of the VHF bands. You can do some pretty amazing things at the high side of the sun cycle. This isn't ham radio related, but for those of you that are CB operators, high sunspot cycle, or you know when you're at the high side of the sun cycle, CB operators can do amazing skip shooting, which is again, refracting off the ionosphere and make really impressive contact. Same thing applies, 10 meters, six meters, 12 meters, 15 meters, you know, all the way up to 20 is gonna propagate crazy during the sunspot cycle. All right, wrapping things up, T3C11, why do VHF and UHF radio signals usually travel somewhat farther than the visual line of sight distance between two stations? And that's the answer is C, the earth seems less curved to radio waves than to light. So I've been saying line of sight and that you're thinking your eyeball, I can transmit to whatever I see, kind of, sort of, in actuality, you can transmit a bit further. So maybe more line of sight of your radio than line of sight of your eyeballs. All right, well, so that is sub element three, the third hardest uh, sub element within the technician license pool. Again, a big thank you to hamstudy.org. If you want to help support hamstudy.org, think about getting yourself a signal stuff signal stick. Cost about $20 and in my mind is pretty much the best antenna that you can put on a handy talkie. They also have mobile antennas and J-pole antennas that you can put on your house for operating at home or on your car. They're, they're great antennas and the sales fund hamstudy.org. So if you've used hamstudy.org to get your license, take practice tests or actually test online, it's very likely the software you're using for that online testing you took was built, paid for, at least in part, by hamstudy.org. So big shout out to them. Thanks so much for doing it. If you thought this was helpful, I would appreciate you showing me by clicking that thumbs up and leaving a comment and telling me about what worked, what didn't work. I'll always try to improve these as we go along and I'll be doing these in the future as the question pools start to change. And ideally we'll maybe do one for general and who maybe even extra. Uh, <laughs> so I hope you stick around. I hope you click the thumbs up and subscribe. I do live stream every Saturday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and every other Wednesday for Ham Nation at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I'm Josh, KI6NAZ. You've been watching the Hammer to Crash Course. Thank you so much for doing, the, doing so. <laughs> Take it easy. See ya.